It's an enormous pleasure and privilege to introduce our speaker for today, Professor Tom Carruthers. Um, he's a senior vice president for studies, I think that means overseeing all research, uh, at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's also a leading authority in international support for democracy, human rights, governance, the rule of law, and civil society. He's uh, also a distinguished uh, visiting professor at the Central European University in Budapest and also has been a faculty member at John Hopkins uh, School for International Service, I think, SAIS, and no stranger to the UK, having been at Nuffield College in Oxford University. Um, as many of you are familiar with his work, he's had an enormous influence on the field of development studies, including his work on development aid, politics, democracy, and accountability. Um, today, um, he's gonna speak, uh, I'm very excited, he's gonna speak, uh, with us uh, about his recent book called Democracies Divided. <clears throat> there are flyers here for it, and it talks about the rise of political polarization uh, around the world. Um, I'm hoping that uh, he's going to give us uh, not only his analysis of uh, the factors that have led to the situation, but also some of the, uh, some of the ways out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, hopefully. As usual, he'll speak for about uh, half an hour to 45 minutes, and then we'll have Q&A. I know some of you have uh, <coughs> lectures and classes uh, at two, so if you need to leave, please leave from the door behind. And uh, yeah, and if there's a fire alarm, of course, uh, you have to go outside um, to the collection point, uh, assembly point. Thank you very much. Over to you, Tom. Okay, thank you. I think I'm going to come around and stand since it's a big room and I'd like to be able to see everyone. Well, first of all, I'd like to say what a pleasure it is to be here at IDS. Uh, I invited myself. Uh, you guys didn't invite me. Uh, I was coming to the UK for talks in various places and I thought, uh, where can I come and find an audience of really interesting, informed, and engaging people? And I thought of IDS. Um, I also thought about the first time I came to IDS in the 90s to give a talk. Mick Moore and Mark Robinson, who was here then, invited me, and uh, I came to the room, and there was exactly one person in the audience. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, there's a lesson there in life about perseverance, and you stick with it, and uh, you know, roll with the punches. Uh, so it's good to be, and I've been back a few times since, and always really enjoyed it. <clears throat> the study of democracy has taken a turn in the last five to seven years. In the first 20 or 30 years after the sort of surge of democracy in the world in the 1980s and early 90s, studies of democratic governance focused on concepts of transition and consolidation. In simple terms, it was kind of charting the successes and, and challenges of democracy. But in the last five to seven years, it's taken a darker turn, and there's a lot of focus on democracy's crisis, if you will. Some people view it as decline. There's a lot of study of democratic backsliding, and a lot of study of the rise of illiberalism, studies of s sort of systematic problems like sta state capture that, that can undermine democracies. And in that growing literature, I felt a couple of years ago looking at it and being part of it that it was missing a focus on something I saw happening in a lot of countries, which was a kind of an intensification of political conflict and taking the form of uh, severe polarization that was having very negative consequences on a lot of different democracies. It was also a kind of a personal analytic journey for myself, this book and this project, because I live in a country which has been polarizing very severely for a number of decades, but in the last several years, even more so. And it's interesting, you know, there are 35 books published in the last 10 years on polarization in the United States. Not a single book comparing polarization around the world. And none of those 35 books, I've looked at them all, mentions the rest of the world. It's puzzling. Uh, it's part of the, just that <clears throat> charming US habit of obsessing about yourself and not thinking the rest of the world has any relevance to you. But uh, it reflects a deeper myopia in thinking about this topic. So I decided to try to take a comparative look. And I looked around and I chose some case studies based <coughs> on a desire, as always in a case selection, to have some countries that seem to fully embody or exhibit the syndrome and others that were short of it but showing some warning signs or partial features of it. And then I put together a group of authors, uh, specialists from all of those countries who I knew would have the local expertise that I didn't have. 
we work from a common analytic framework. I worked with a co-editor, Andrew O'Donohue, a very talented young researcher, and we put together this book. <clears throat> the case studies we looked at, but I'm, in my talk, I'm going to try to speak a bit more widely, were in Asia. We looked at India, uh, Indonesia, and Bangladesh. In Africa, Kenya, many more cases we could have looked at, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Kenya, in the greater Middle East region, we looked at Turkey, in Europe, at Poland, in North America at the United States, and in Latin America at Brazil and Colombia. So that's the case studies, and I'll talk more about them throughout the course of the talk. And we, the analytic framework we used looks at, we tried to focus on what are the roots of polarization? Uh, what is it that's dividing these societies? Look at the trajectories of the phenomenon and the drivers of it, how does it evolve over time, and what are some of the patterns in that? And then looked at the consequences what are its effects on the politics and the society more generally? And then also uh, looked at remedies and efforts to overcome it, and I will talk a bit about that. Uh, so what I'd like to do in this presentation is just give you some of the highlights from each of those four areas. But I want to leave plenty of time for your questions and comments. I will not focus in my remarks on the United Kingdom or Great Britain, um, but you may have questions about how it looks in comparative light. And it's an interesting question, but I want to first give you the framework and the analysis and then let you think about in what ways do you feel Great Britain is, is or is not a severely polarized country right now. But let's start with a definition, severe polarization. As we know, democracy is a political system which is designed to contain conflict. Conflict is normal in societies, conflict of a certain type, disagreements over points of view, of interests, of philosophies, of pursuits, and so forth. And a democratic political system is supposed to contain that within a system of sort of norms and rules. And, and that's, that's the way it's supposed to work. And a certain amount of polarization is a good thing in democracies. Citizens should have choices. They should have distinct choices. They should have different choices. Um, they shouldn't be presented with a bland menu of just the same thing warmed over in, in different temperatures. And so it's good that societies have some real political divisions within them. Yet, when the divisions become too intense, uh, they become destructive. And that's what we call severe polarization. Look, now, it's a hard thing to define exactly. I mean, here's how we went about it. And we drew on some work uh, on polarization that's been done by Jennifer McCoy and Marat Sommer, two very good academics who've done some, some work in the American Behavioral Scientist on the topic, which I recommend to you. And we define severe polarization as having some of the following characteristics. First, it's when, and we're talking about sort of binary polarization, when there are two sides. You sometimes have cases like Lebanon or maybe Bosnia at certain times that have three or four part polarization. We're talking about binary polarization, two sides. So here are some of the signal characteristics. First, the two sides uh, the <clears throat> two sides have drifted apart from each other in such a significant way that there's very little common ground on matters of significant importance. And so the two sides have pulled apart and shared very little. And what it is that has, each side has signed up to, their own project overrides whatever commonalities do exist among people. So Anu and I may belong to the may same social organization, but we're on different sides of the political fence, and that difference overrides the other commonalities between us as citizens or as, as just fellow humans and becomes sort of so salient that that's what really drives people's thinkings and action. A third characteristic is that <clears throat> it's sustained. Uh, it's something that sets in, and it isn't just a moment. They're polarizing leaders or polarizing episodes, but this is something that sets in and stays to beyond the life of any single political regime. And it's something that <clears throat> spreads from, this, from the elite level down throughout the society. So it may start as a kind of game of political elites contending each other, but it becomes entrenched in the society and integrated throughout the society. So we have a fusion of what people call uh, elite polarization and mass polarization. When you begin to have all of these characteristics, politics takes on uh, <clears throat> the character of a clash between identities rather than between policy frameworks. In kind of, quote, normal democratic politics, the idea is these people over here disagree with these people because they have a different set of views on different policies. On pension reform, they think this. On labor law, they think that. But when politics becomes a clash of identities and belonging, these people say, I disagree with these people it's not because I disagree with your views on these things, though I do. I disagree with you because I'm different from you. And, and I'm different from you often becomes, and I don't like you because you're different from me. 
And I don't like you, unfortunately, often becomes, I hate you because you're different from me. And politics becomes, I belong to this group, and belonging to a group d actually determines your political views more than your political views uh, necessarily shape what group you belong to. It's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon that's been studied both in social psychology but also in, in, in political science. And this clash of identities is, becomes deep and harsh and entrenched. And people use the term, it's very common in the United States now, it's actually a bad term analytically but it grabs the imagination. People say politics becomes tribal. Now that's actually a disservice to tribes and to tribalism um, because actually a lot of societies in which tribes are very important are not highly conflictive and not polarized. But in the Anglo-American imagination, tribes are these sort of atavistic and kind of <coughs> groups that, that just can't live with each other and the belonging to one or the other is, is primary. So politics becomes this clash of identities. <coughs> now, <clears throat> Looking around the world, just a quick, very brief tour of the world, just glancing around to see where we see some of the polarization, uh, you see the following. In Latin America, there's quite a surge in the last 20 years of polarization. Um, we see it in Argentina, which has been living with a polarized society really ever since Juan Domingo Perón emerged in Argentine politics. In Venezuela, since the 1990s, we've had an extremely polarized society in very destructive ways. Colombia has gone through successive episodes of polarization from the 1950s through the 1980s through the current day in different ways. Um, Brazil seems like it may be entering down a path of polarization, although I'd say it's not clear yet, and our chapter on Brazil is quite interesting in that regard. It actually concludes that it's not, but it shows certainly warning signs of that. Bolivia has been polarizing in different ways in the last 10 years, and so forth. So we see in Latin America quite a bit, and there are other cases I can mention. Looking at the Middle East, it's striking that almost everywhere, with one or two exceptions, where you have some degree of political pluralism, you have deep polarization. Turkey is really intensely polarized. Palestinian politics have been deeply polarized for, for a while. Israeli politics have become increasingly polarized in the last 10 years. Uh, Egypt, when it had its pluralizing moment from 2011 to 2013, became very rapidly and intensely polarized. Uh, an interesting country that's an ex exception, Iran, I would say, is quite polarized to the extent it has pluralistic politics. An interesting exception is Tunisia, which maybe we can talk about later, a country that seemed primed for polarization in 2011 when it moved away from authoritarian rule, but has actually avoided the worst sins of polarization. And we, we could come back to that. In Sub-Saharan Africa, big continent, I can't really do it justice, but we see we have the case of Kenya in the book of polarization for many years between the Kikuyu and the Luau tribes, although they mobilized other groups, and it's a complicated story. Mozambique has been very polarized between through Frelimo and Renamo forces. Cote d'Ivoire has gone through intensive polarization episodes in the last 20 years. Uh, Zimbabwe, to the extent it had political pluralism over the last 20 years, has often been very polarized between two sides. Cameroon shows some disturbing signs of, of growing polarization and so forth around the region. In Asia, as I mentioned, the case studies we look at, India has been on a path of polarization for some time now, uh, dividing the country between a, a sort of Hindu nationalist conception of what India should be as a society versus a different one that's more secular and pluralist. Bangladesh has had very intense elite polarization, although there's a lively debate among scholars of Bangladesh about how much that's really spread into the society or whether or not it's just an elite game, but it's certainly a destructive pattern in its national politics. Indonesia shows some warning signs of polarization, but it's not there yet. The last three elections in Indonesia have each uh, demonstrated a fissure between more Islamist kind of views of the society and less ones. Uh, Thailand, red shirts, yellow shirts, and breakdown of Thai politics over this division, intensely polarized. Sri Lanka, at different times in the last 20 or 30 years, has experienced this. The Philippines may be going through a polarizing moment. We're not really sure. It's certainly going through a difficult political time and so forth. And then closer to home, uh, we see in Europe uh, some cases, Belgium has kind of been a long-time polarized society that sort of lived with polarization throughout its modern history. Uh, we see Poland having become severely polarized just in the last 10 years. Hungary, also in the last 10 years. Great Britain, as I said, is a question mark, but Brexit has been a very polarizing identity politics moment for Great Britain. 
and some other cases we can talk about, and then the United States. So as we looked at, to turn to the first question, so it's a, it's a complex landscape out there. There's a lot going on. That was just a, a three-minute three tour, but one could look uh, more deeply into it and see a lot. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> when we looked at the roots of polarization, we asked ourselves, what is the basis of division in these many places? We found there are sort of three categories. The first are ethnic divides, or an, an ethnic divide that becomes primary in the political life. And I, I think in, in, again, sort of the Anglo-American political imagination, we tend to think that's a primary cause of polarization because we have a sort of a fear of ethnic politics as being very harsh and divisive. And it can be, and there are a number of particularly sub-Saharan African countries all, as well as Bosnia and other places in the Balkans where it has been. But in our studies, that was actually not as common as we thought. What's more common is the second category, which is religion. Religion is polarizing the politics of many countries. And it's different religions. We see it with Islam and Turkey. Between, and it's not differences between one religion and another. It's usually between a more fundamentalist conception of a religion and a less fundamentalist conception of the religion. So in Turkey, it's a largely uh, you know, Muslim-majority country, but there are serious differences between the AKP and the opposition over the role of religion in, in public life and in politics. Um, in Indonesia, that's the dividing line as well, a, a, similar, a similar line. So in, we see it in some Muslim-majority countries. We see it in India, oh, India over Hindu nationalism. So we see it with a different religion. We see it in Israel with a more fundamentalist uh, Judaic or Jewish conception of, of the role of religion in public life. We see it with Christianity in Poland, uh, and I would say in the United States as well. Our attorney general or minister of justice just two weeks ago attacked what he called the campaign of militant secularism trying to, quote, destroy the fabric of our country. Um, and so that's a nice statement of religious polarization that those who have a more religious conception of politics versus those militant secularists he refers to. Um, <clears throat> so religion is <clears throat> very divisive and it's, as we know, for reasons I think nobody quite understands, the role of religion in the life of people in many countries around the world is, is changing, it's rising. And with that is coming uh, a greater basis for political division. That's the second category. The third is ideology. Now, we think of ideology as not necessarily being identity, and it isn't. If I'm traditionally, I live in the UK, <clears throat> say in the 1990s, and I'm a labor voter, a conservative voter, we have ideological differences. It's not necessarily a particularly strong identity divide. But when ideology becomes a contest of two really such contrasting visions that they can't live with each other. Think of Venezuela in the 1990s. Hugo Chavez emerges, articulates over time a Bolivarian revolution for the country, an ideological vision of a different country run differently, both socially and economically. That's an ideological divide in the society that, that is profound and becomes an identity divide. You are a Chavista or you are not a Chavista if you're a Venezuela. And that's a fundamental question about you and your place in that society. And so ideology, when it, when it becomes a severe division, can become an identity, an identity divide of that type. And the, and the ideological division may be primarily, primarily socioeconomic, like in Venezuela, sort of redistributive economics versus market capitalism, or it can be more sociocultural ideology. In Poland, for example, the division is more about a conservative sort of anti-progressive vision, rejecting LGBTQ rights, rejecting the changed role of women in society, rejecting migration and multiculturalism versus uh, a different view. So ideology can either be primarily sort of socioeconomic or it can be more sociocultural. So <clears throat> these are the things that seem to be dividing people and they seem to be on the increase. Uh, as I mentioned, religion seems to be on the increase and socioeconomic divides are growing more severe, as we see in Latin America over citizen dissatisfaction, over the performance of the market system there has led to a strong reaction, the formation of alternative visions, and led to considerable polarization. Uh, we see sociocultural divides rising with sort of a pushback against a, quote, progressive agenda or cosmopolitanism or globalization in many countries. And so for various reasons, there's no single factor, these divisions are becoming more intense and more profound, I would say. Now, turning to trajectories, it's interesting that there's no, we looked hard for sort of what is the pattern of polarization? Is there a, a common pattern that occurs? We found that there's actually at least three different patterns. Uh, and it's not always clear why a society is gonna go through one rather than another. 
One is you, a society, a, <clears throat> a place becomes a country, a state is formed, a state is born, and there's a, what political scientists would call a formative rift in the country, some kind of basic division. And you see it there at the time of the founding of the, of the state. And like in Kenya, we could see already, or those around could see in the early 1960s that there was a, there was a significant divide in Kenya between two major uh, tribal communities, although there are many other tribes present and salient uh, between these two. And ever since then, Kenyan politics has tried to mediate this divide and tried to live with it and struggled with it. So it's a, a, an initial rift that just doesn't go away. You just sort of can't seem to get beyond it. And somehow the Kenyan state has had trouble eclipsing or subsuming that rift. Or a different pattern is you can, you can see such a rift when a state is formed, but it doesn't become that divisive for a long time. And then sometime later in the country's history, it emerges like a cork surfacing after being held down for some time. Think of Turkey. Back in the 1920s when Ataturk formed modern Turkey, uh, there was a, you know, an intense debate in Turkey of are we a, are we a Islamic country? Are we a secular republic? And there was, you know, a big struggle, but there was a secular vision of Turkey that kind of won out. And Turkey from the 1920s till the 1990s was, was that Turkey. But then for various reasons, a different movement, a movement emerged in Turkey uh, that pushed for the other vision of Turkey and said, no, we've, we put up with this long enough, we want Turkey to be a different Turkey. We want women to wear headscarves. We want to have religious schools where people get their primary education. We want to have different social laws. We want a different Turkey. But it took a long time for that to surface. India is another example. <clears throat> India, way back if you read the writings of Indian intellectuals in the 19th century talking about what could India be as a country, there was immediately a debate over would we be, are we a Hindu country or are we would be a multicultural sort of place. And the multicultural vision won out with Gandhi and the emergence of independent India. But then in the 1980s and 90s, the Hindu nationalist movement kind of emerged and said, no, we have a different vision of India. We're, we're tired of this multiculturalism and say this whole Congress party project, no, we have a different vision for India. And people began to sign up for that vision and to ascribe to it and to vote for it. And so it's like a river running with something under the surface that comes up and so that causes one to think about why then and what has, what has prompted it. We'll come back to that. And then a third pattern is no apparent rift, but then suddenly the country is divided. Poland is a bit like that. If you asked a Pole in the 1990s, how, how divided is your country? They would say, well, we're ethnically very homogeneous, extremely homogeneous. We're religiously extremely homogeneous. Um, we don't have high levels of inequality. We don't have, we're sort of on board with the market agenda for post-communist Poland. So no, we're not that divided. And then suddenly in 2010, and since Poland has become racked by an intense division. There's an interesting article by Anne Applebaum, who some of you may know her writings, uh, spends a lot of time in Poland, and she writes about a New Year's Eve party in 1999 that she hosted at her house, and how 20 years later, she's not speaking to half those people anymore. And she asks herself, we were all friends in 1999. We all went to the same New Year's Eve party, and now we hate each other and we don't speak to each other. And she said, why is that? What happened to our country? So there's the puzzle of societies that don't seem to have a rift, but then pull apart around something. That's what makes it <clears throat> unpredictable when you say, I'm gonna go to a country and do a kind of polarization warning, you know, look, it's, it's, it's difficult to tell, actually. And, you know, again, just referring to Brexit, many British people were surprised by the power of this identity issue that was, you know, 1% of British people 10 years ago named membership in the European Union is a, a highly significant issue for this country, yet there it comes, it emerges, you know, somewhat unexpectedly and tears the country apart in different ways. So different patterns. <clears throat> in all of the patterns, uh, polarizing leaders tend to play a very significant role. When you look at the drivers, you see a project of polarization, a cause embodied by a leader, driven by a leader, and the polarizing leader has a kind of playbook, a, a polarizing playbook that he or she, usually he, uh, plays from. And, and once you see it, whether it's Netanyahu or Erdogan or Modi or probably Duterte in different ways, once you see it, it has very familiar elements. The polarizing playbook starts with the leader himself. Like I said, we actually haven't found any good examples of polarizing women leaders, but we're happy to hear suggestions. Um, Indira Gandhi may, might qualify. Um, 
But so I'll say he here because that's uh, all the cases we looked at. The polarizing leader personally embodies the identity cause. He stands for it. He, he, when Chavez was on national television speaking to Venezuelans, he was the cause. He said, people like us are finally gonna take this country back from people like them. And look at me, I'm that person, and I'm gonna do it myself. Uh, Erdogan on television looks at the Turkish people and says, I'm leading this country. I am the embodiment of this movement. So first, you embody the cause, the identity. Second, you you demonize the other, you other the other. You don't talk in conventional terms of political opposition. You describe them as bad people. They're not opposition. These are bad people. They're different. They're not loyal. They're treasonous. They're dangerous. Um, just last week, uh, the President of the United States referred to some critics in his own party who criticized him. He referred to them as human scum. Um, that's polarizing language. You don't cooperate with scum. You eliminate it. You clean it up. <clears throat> so you, you create a political narrative that, that, that's highly destructive in that sense. Third <clears throat> in the playbook is that you, uh, you choose symbolic issues. You don't polarize the country over pension reform. You polarize the country over whether we can build a Hindu temple on the grounds of this mosque. This is our land. We, the Hindus, are going to take back the land that belongs to us, and we're going to build this mosque. I'm going to spend more time and energy talking about this issue than about a boring topic like pension reform. So you choose symbolic issues, and you drive them day in, day out, and you push on them. And then the fourth element of the polarizing playbook is, its rel is relentlessness. You, you do this every single day. There's no rest for the polarizing leader. You get up and you polarize every single day. It's a project. You have to advance it. It's a boulder you are pushing uh, along a path, up a hill, down a hill. And you know, a few weeks ago, in September actually, the president of the US got up one weekend and over the course of the weekend sent 112 tweets uh, of anger and hatred towards other people. That's a lot of tweets in one. We sit down some weekend and send 112 tweets. It, you know, there's not much time for you know, watching sports or anything else um, that the president likes to do. <coughs> uh, and so there's a relentlessness to this project, which is very characteristic. You think of these leaders, Netanyahu, Erdogan, Duterte, they are relentless. They're relentless people who are pushing a project all the time. Polarization doesn't happen. It doesn't happen like you know, falling from the air. It is done. It is manufactured. It is, it is, it is carried out and, and implemented. Now, some people <clears throat> wonder about, at this point, when you think about trajectories and drivers about social media, and there's a common response of, this must all be the fault of social media. Social media is, I think, a very important magnifier or accelerator of polarization. It allows the 112 tweets to go out to the followers, and information from the leadership becomes like a drip feed in the arm of the citizens of the country. They're just You can get the antibiotics or the disease right into the bloodstream all the time. And that's a very, very effective way of motivating, energizing, creating emotions in people. So social media also, of course, allows the manipulation of information more easily. There's a lot of, as studies have shown, tendency for people to click on more extreme things. They're drawn towards more extreme views. Centrist articles are boring. You want to see, oh, what's that funny one? The real truth about Trump's wife. Oh, what is the real truth about Trump's wife? Rather than the article about why the social security system is running out of funding, funding or something boring like that. Um, of actual consequence to the society. And so <clears throat> you, uh, social media clearly has characteristics of an accelerator, but I caution people to say it's not uh, a cause. And if social media were to be better regulated, that might help address it and it might help alleviate it, but it's not going to eliminate. This tendency is much deeper than just the rise of social media. We, I think we feel this particularly in the United States because we experienced the most intensive decade of polarization prior to the last three years was the 1990s, and it was the, the rise of talk radio and private cable television were fundamental in the, the new messaging of polarization well before social media. So in a way, a polarizing project or narrative is like water that's going to push around any obstacles. And if you create regulations on social media, it'll go somewhere else. It'll find other ways to reach people. So I'm not against good and needed debates over you know, how should social media function in modern societies, but I don't think we should think that's it, that's the problem. We've got our finger on it and we're going to solve it. Now, what stops or limits polarization? Um, there are various guardrails, and that's what we call them in the book. The first set of guardrails are, are norms, soft norms, but meaningful norms in societies. These may be traditions of moderation, 
traditions where, you know, a politician does something immoderate and people say, I can't respect this politician. That's just not done in this country. We don't talk that way. We don't act that way. Traditions of moderation, traditions of fairness, traditions of fair play, traditions of truthfulness. There, there are norms that try to contain, you know, these sort of dangerous sort of political projects or actors that are straining at the system. But these norms turn out to be fairly soft. And, and a polarizing steamroller comes, and they're like sort of soft animals, like squirrels, underneath the wheels of the steamroller that get squashed and flattened and come out the other side. And you say, well, they can really do that. They can lie constantly. They can exaggerate. They can be immoderate. They can be unfair. They can be intolerant. And their followers still follow them. The followers like it. They respond to this. And so the soft norms prove to be surprisingly soft in many cases. Then you have harder guardrails, which are more institutional guardrails. And we highlight a few in the book, although there are various and they depend on the society. First and foremost, the most important guardrail is our independent legal institutions. Uh, the rule of law, or independent legal institutions, are a source of authority above the polarizing fray that contains the actors and says, you have to live in this framework. You want to do this to, to this institution? No. The laws say you can't do this, and the courts say that you can't do this. This is crucial. This is the single biggest factor that contains polarization. In India, for example, the strength of parts of the legal system, including the highest court, are very important in, in, as a bulwark against some of the worst excesses of polarization. But as a result, because it's such an important guardrail, it becomes a primary focus of attack of a polarizing project. And so judicial reform, as it's usually called, is one of the first agenda items of Fidesz in Hungary, PIS in Poland, uh, Erdogan in Turkey, replace the judges, undercut judicial independence, change judicial selection, and so forth. So you go after the legal institutions because they're your, your first and biggest guardrail. A second guardrail are, is independent election administration. If you can have, uh, if you can at least preserve independent credible election administration, that's a limit on a polarizing project or a polarized situation. At least the citizens do get to decide at periodic times what, what they want to have politically in the country, in a sense. And independent election administration is, you feel it in these places really crucially, like both in Turkey and in Hungary recently, there were local elections. And in both cases, the opposition, co opposition coalition contested the dominant force and I remember talking both to Turkish and Hungarian friends, and I said, do you think, suppose in Istanbul the opposition actually wins a majority, do you think that will be reported? Will, that, will your independent election administration hold up under the deforming pressure of the polarizing project? Same in Hungary. And in both cases, people said, I'm not sure. I think we still have it, but we'll see in a way. And in both cases, it was still there. Um, opposition coalitions managed to win significant elections in both places. It's an example of it holding up. But in other places, of course, it hasn't held up. So in Bangladesh in the 90s, uh, the BNP, one of the two main parties, attacked independent election administration, undercut it in certain ways, and reprisals from the other side in a similar vein. And so it becomes a subject of attack. We're still in the United States fighting 200 years into our democracy over what are the rules of voter access. Do you have to show this identification? Do you have to do this? We can't settle this question. It's too polarized. There's too much pressure on our independent election administration system for us to be able to settle this question. And the third guardrail, of course, is the Constitution. It's the framework. It says, everybody, we live under this. This is our, this is our framework. We hold this. This is how we operate. And so the polarizing project usually wants, quote, constitutional reform or a new constitution. Erdogan took him a while, but Erdogan in Turkey eventually got a new constitution and elevated himself from prime minister to president. Um, Hungary carried out significant constitutional reforms and so forth. So the Constitution is the ultimate target. You want to reshape the whole political system in that way. Now, turning to the third section on consequences, I'll be brief here because the consequences, in a sense, I've already talked about, but they're probably also obvious to you from your own observations of places. At the political level, you have a tremendous amount of gridlock, political dysfunction, sort of frictive governance and very unproductive governance that tends to come. Uh, <clears throat> you also have, at the political level, the deformation and, and of institutions that are pressured, like put under sort of geological pressure and, and crushed under this, this pressure coming from the polarization process. At the societal level, you have a dim diminution of societal cohesion. Society begins to, to uh, levels of anger intensify, and there's a lot of surveys of what 
political sociologists or others call affective polarization, which is when you ask these people and say, if your child married someone or proposed to marry someone of a different political party, how would you feel about that? Or would you do business if you knew that company or contractor was from the other political party? You sort of measure the views about willingness to cooperate socially with people from the other side. Uh, the sort of famous dinner time arguments over a particular issue that become so divisive the family simply can't discuss them or even get together for dinner at certain points. <clears throat> um, and so uh, societal cohesion and then usually violence. Violence is a, is a good indicator of polarization. Social violence, socio-political violence uh, that's you know, often targeted at outgroups on one side of the polarizing divide but a rising fever that of, of anger that tends to lead to violent episodes and all the countries I mentioned have rising levels of political violence. We just had a workshop at Carnegie in September on political violence in the United States in which we asked a number of specialists from Africa to come and talk about how they dealt with rising violence in African countries because the United States has very disturbing rise in political violence in the last two or three years and we wanted to get ideas from other places about how to deal with this problem. Um, but the, the ultimate consequences can be looked at as following. <clears throat> if, in a simple sense, metaphorically, if I put Robin and Mick in a car, they're very polarized, they can't get along, and, I, and you ask, where are they gonna end up? Where is this car, what's the ultimate destination of a polarized country? There are five ultimate destinations. The first is the worst. <clears throat> I'll put them in order of, of awfulness from, from worse to somewhat better. The first is civil war. They just could break down. I mean, they just break down and fight in the country. Colombia in the 1940s and 50s is a tragic example of a country between the liberals and conservatives, or however they called themselves in different ways, just could not get along and descended into a gruesome, really gruesome civil war. Um, <coughs> Cote d'Ivoire in, in the 2000s, really, had episodes of just breaking into civil conflict over identity, identity politics issues. So civil war is the worst destination where you can end up. Next on the list is military intervention, domestic military intervention, where the military in the country says, stop the polarizing madness, this is crazy. We have to step in, we're outside the political fray. Bangladesh, 2000, late 2000s, military stepped in and said, we're, we've just had it with this back and forth, it's becoming very destructive in this country. We need to step in, have a caretaker government, maybe take the heads of the political parties, put them over in detention somewhere, reboot the, push the reboot button on politics and try to restart the politics of this country. Didn't work, actually quite, quite unsuccessful, um, but that's what it was about at least in some ways, although there were of course other interests involved. Thailand in 2014, the Thai military stepping in and saying, chaos is coming to our country on the streets and the red shirts and the yellow shirts can't get along, it's destructive, the country needs to be run by a sane military dictatorship for a while. We'll do that and at some point turn it back over to the civilians once you're ready to uh, behave better. <clears throat> um, Egypt, 2013, uh, the Egyptian military saying we've become too polarized, the Muslim Brotherhood has a project that's incompatible with the rest of the country, we need to stop this, we'll step in, some sort of cooling off period. Again, an actual authoritarian project in their case, but step in. So military intervention is a consequence in some cases. A third <clears throat> outcome is illiberal, sort of rising illiberalism and decay of democracy to the point of becoming a competitive authoritarian system, in a sense where one of the two sides gets stronger and stronger and begins to squeeze the life out of the other side and squeeze the life out of democracy in the country to the point where the country is no longer a democracy. This is Turkey's story over the last 15 years. Turkey today is not really a functioning democracy. It was 15 years ago. And one side has simply squeezed the life out of both most of the opposition and the free press and the judicial independence and other key features. And so that's a characteristic. Poland is at risk of that. People worry about it. It may not happen, but it's at risk. <clears throat> a fourth option is sort of short of that, but has some features of that uh, we describe as just majoritarianism, where you have two different sides, but one side has gained enough power that people on the other side become second-class citizens. There's simply being a Muslim in India today is not like it was 20 years ago. You now live in a different situation in your own country. You feel either legally, formally, or informally you face a series of barriers or obstacles to exercising your pursuit of life that are, that are significant. And so majoritarianism becomes uh, an outcome. And then <clears throat> the fifth category is democratic dysfunction. So this is where I would put the United States, um, is where the country just performs very poorly on basic democratic governance indicators. 
terms of actual efficiency, social cohesion is damaged, political violence is rising, and sim simply the system is churning in unproductive ways. So this is serious business. Polarization, when it sets in, is entrenched and sustained, leads to some very serious consequences. So let me turn finally to remedies. At this point in the talk, you're probably thinking, boy, I hope he has the answer, because otherwise this is really depressing. Um, <clears throat> I think if we had the answer, the book would have been called The Answer to Polarization. Uh, would have sold more copies. Um, look, there isn't an answer, but we did, you know, we looked hard, and in fact, this is just the start of a larger research project we're doing now. We're going to turn more intense and sustained attention to some of the experiences in different countries of trying to address or to overcome it. What you see in most countries that have become very polarized is a strong desire for a depolarizing leader. People say, if only we had a really good leader who could just bring this country back together. It's just such an attractive phrase, bring this country back together. And everyone nods there and says, yes, why is it that we're stuck in this? We just had the right leader who could do this. And look at the choices we have. They're so terrible. <clears throat> why don't we have a leader who can bring us back together? Um, that sounds good. So we looked for that. We hunted around uh, analytically, and we couldn't find many examples, actually. Uh, of such leaders. You can find a little bit. Ecuador is an interesting example. You had Rafael Correa, who ran the country for a few years or a number of years, very polarizing, kind of from, from the left, and then chose a successor from his own party, Lenin Moreno, who then was elected. But Moreno just has a different character, a different style than Correa, and he's, he's not so polarizing. He stepped back and said, no, we don't have to be so confrontational. We don't have to push against the institutions. Um, and as I'll talk about, that hasn't won him uh, much popularity in Ecuador, but it's, it's something. In Ethiopia, I don't actually think of Ethiopia as having been highly polarized in the way that I'm talking. It was largely just an authoritarian project for many years. But the new leader is trying to lower the intense conflict in political life, and so he got the Nobel Prize, because it's unusual to do so, to be a reformer of that type. But I don't actually see him as a depolarizer in quite, quite strict terms. Why is it so hard to be a depolarizer? I think it's because if you're elected, <clears throat> your base, whoever was your core base, they don't necessarily want you to compromise. They're, they're your core base. They're out for blood. You know, they want you to smash the other side and take back whatever they took from them. And then the other side, you reach out to them and they look at you and say, yeah, right, you know, what's this? Uh, why should I trust you? <clears throat> this is probably just a tactic on your part. It's probably just a sideways, sideways motion before you get on with your project. So a polarized society thinks it wants a depolarizing leader, but, but rarely chooses one. Um, it's hard to choose one. They're often not available as choices, but even when they do get elected, they don't win many points for, for trying it. Uh, Moreno has gotten very little political credit for that. He's getting hit very hard for his austerity policies and programs and unhappiness over that. It's gotten very little political credit for his depolarizing moves. So that's discouraging. But there are, there are you see countries struggling and taking steps. So they, they, look, they follow along a framework like this. It starts with political institutional reform. You look at the institutional configuration and you say, what is it about the way the political system is configured that may contribute to polarization. And so in Kenya, after the 2007 elections that were very violent and very polarized in Kenya, the country went through a kind of uh, a coming to terms with its own troubled self and created a, a set of reforms uh, centered around constitutional reform and other things. Part of it was to decentralize power. And so people said, we need to, take, we need to lower the stakes of national politics and push power out because that'll reduce the tendency to treat the state as the ultimate prize. So decentralization has been tried elsewhere as, as a way to try to depolarize a bit, although it's certainly not a magic bullet. <coughs> decentralization has lots of issues with it. Or you may look at the electoral system or the voting system and say, maybe we need either <clears throat> different kinds of rules about political party formation, maybe we should make it easier for political parties to form, lower the threshold for parliamentary representation, lower the qualifying standards. Peru tried this in, a while ago with a political party law to try to make it easier in some ways for political parties to form. Didn't really work very well. Um, or you could change the actual voting system. People experimented in different countries with ranked choice voting that gives voters a chance to vote for multiple people in priority and therefore encourage sort of centrist results even if you get to express a less centrist initial reaction and so forth. So you can look hard at that. 
And you can also look at the basic question of presidentialism versus uh, a Westminster type system and say maybe presidentialism is, is polarizing, maybe we should avoid that and make a, you know, a different kind of choice and so forth. So political institutional reforms are one big area that, that need attention and, and get attention in some cases. Um, then there's also uh, work kind of more from civic, civil society that says, well, the political class is polarized and they're, you know, they're not going to change. So we, the society, have to respond in a number of ways. And you see a lot of countries where there are a lot of bridging exercises or efforts or activities of people who get together and say, we need to create a national coalition of this in order to respond to the polarizing narrative and create an alternative narrative or alternative action and, and coordination and community around uh, consensus ideas. And, and you see a lot of well-intentioned and, and thoughtful things. You also see a lot of kind of civil society amateurism over polarization where people think, I know, we'll just do a lot of things where we get together in a room with these people and these people and talk and realize we all like each other. That doesn't work so well. Um, people tend to get in a room and realize just how much they hate each other. Um, uh, so uh, the idea that if we could just get them in that you know, proverbial room, yeah, try it sometime. Um, see how you come away feeling when you hear the other side really tell their version of reality um, and how impervious they are to your counter arguments. Uh, so, but, but thoughtful civil society work is being done, particularly on religious issues where you see people responding to change religious narratives and say we have to be very careful about, in Indonesia you see some people trying hard to say we need to be very careful, we've seen what's happened in Turkey and Egypt and elsewhere, we need to be very careful about where our society is going and think about the role of religious education, and religious practice and other things. So there are things to be done there. <coughs> you can focus at the media level and think hard about not just social media, but others is what is it that, how can media play a more constructive role in this? Are there enterprises that could be supported that would you know, create more common narratives in the country or bring people together in information ways? Are there, or are there media literacy training that we can do with citizens to help them understand what they're getting and under, to read misinformation, misinformation or disinformation better and respond more? There's an exploding field of media literacy programs in places like Ukraine and elsewhere uh, to, <clears throat> to help that. So there's, there's work that can be done as well and, and other things. So there's, there's many different levels at which this problem can be addressed and as with all problems, there is no magic solution. I mean, societies that have gone down a long polarizing road, it's going to be a long road out of it because it, it's entrenched into the DNA of people's minds, their hearts, their minds, their habits. And changing that takes a long time. <clears throat> and it, but it doesn't happen by itself necessarily. It doesn't cure itself. There needs to be a focus on it. And what we tried to do in this book really is to get both kind of outside actors, donor community, and others who don't always think this way about a society they're working in, but also people within societies to conceptualize the problem as such and, and respond to it. So I hope this has uh, helped at least shape your own thinking a bit about the topic and giving you an analytic framework to, to analyze your own experiences or places you're working in and observed. And I'm curious to hear your reactions and eager to hear your thoughts on the topic as well. Thank you very much. talk. Um, so we um, are going to open the floor. We'll take uh, rounds of questions, maybe three at a time, and then give you a chance to respond. Um, I'd like to pass the mic around when you're asking questions and uh, raise your hands, please. And if you need to leave, leave from the back. Yeah, we'll start here with Tom. Tom, thank you very much for a, a very powerful and, and comprehensive Not sure it's uh, on. Yeah. presentation. Yes, it's on. <laughs> yeah, now it sounds like it's on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is it? No. Is it? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for a very powerful and comprehensive. Um, presentation and, and you know what was we can all see the kind of trends and there's lots and lots of examples as you say. Uh, I suppose my basic question is really why now? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean there's always been political polarization. Why is this mm -hmm. happening? 
And you placed a lot of emphasis on, in your analysis on, on political leadership, which I think is, is crucial. Uh, but I'm just, the question really is, do you think there's something mm -hmm. okay. uh, yeah. going on? Mm -hmm. And what can we learn from countries that, like Colombia, for example, that have actually kind of, in a sense, begun to reverse the process of you know, deep-seated legacies of polarization which go back Okay. Um, Can I add? Please. To this, because I wanted to piggyback on this mm -hmm. question, which was to say that um, you don't talk about the eco economy yeah. and mm -hmm. any of the material factors, yeah. in a sense, okay. of what's driving this. And I was wondering, um, I guess, I mean, I come from India and I, I can't see any of those mm -hmm. ways out that you were <laughs> suggesting right. of this. And the only thing I can see is perhaps sort of a real downturn in the economy that mm -hmm. will get us out of this. Yeah. Okay, sure. Okay, let me take the question first about political financing and that question and then come to the why now, which is big. It's a, it's a big <laughs> question. It relates to your questions as well. On the political financing, I'd say I wouldn't, it's both companies but also wealthy individuals, but it is also the case in the last 20 or 30 years, partly it's just many more democracies and much more pluralistic politics, but also a lot of deregulation of political financing, unfortunately. A lot of private money entering democratic politics in a lot of countries. And private money is, of course, motivated by interests. Now, it may be economic interests that you know, pursue a candidate and hope to capture them in certain ways, but it's also often ideological interests. In the United States, they've done studies and looked at the wealthy people who contribute a lot to politics, clearly, those who are more ideologically motivated contribute more. There's a fairly clear correlation between intensity of ideological commitment or belief and willingness to reach into your wallet and give a lot of money to politics. And so opening up a political system to a lot of private financing encourages extremism in a sense, in a simple sense. Public financing, you know, to some extent discourages that. And so that's, that's clearly a, a factor. The economic factor, it's interesting now, is that <coughs> Um, there's not a single pattern in that both Turkey and India are particularly interesting in this regard is that Turkey has had, a, you know, from early 2000s until about five years ago, Turkey had the best economic run of its life. It had 15 years of remarkable growth. The Turkish economy was transformed. It was a growing pie rapidly, and it was the most polarizing period in, in Turkish political life. And so the idea that it's just, you know, some people think, oh, it must be economic problems polarize a country. Well, that's not the case in Turkey. Actually, it's the opposite. In India also. India has polarized during the time when the Indian economy actually finally started growing fairly well. 
And so in some cases, that's like that. <clears throat> and in Venezuela, or the Latin American cases, you have polarization where there's sometimes growth, but very high levels of inequality, levels of exclusion or corruption. And so Chavez comes, actually Venezuela hadn't been doing too bad macro, macroeconomically, yet it had been doing very bad in terms of equity. And, and, and so, so any sort of idea that one could just sort of calculate a simple economic explanation for this, it's clear that there are other factors. So that leads to the more general question of why now. I think, you know, I, there are times where I'd like to sort of posit a kind of large, almost mystical factor that somehow explains it because that would be satisfying. If I, I can't find one, to the extent I can think of one, I do think there's something to the notion that <clears throat> as democracies have matured both in established Western democracies but also in the newer democracies of the developing world, for whatever reasons having to do with how life is changing, individuals seem to be searching for meaning in different ways and that the traditional political divisions and struggles aren't where they're finding meaning. And so new political projects come along that offer them a kind of meaning by belonging to something and, and feeling like I, that's something I, I really want. I mean, I've tried to talk to friends of mine who study Indian politics to say, I don't quite understand why did Hindu nationalism arise when it did in India? So what, why then? And, and they said, you know, there was this sense among many Indians, we're starting to do pretty well, we're modernizing. We, we, now, we now want something more. We want the country to reflect, you know, we're actually tired of the old project. We want a new project, which is, which is different. And it, it's, it's a bit of a puzzle, and it, it, like I say, it's, it sounds a bit mystical, but it aligns with people who are arguing that the condition of modern life and the relation of individual to both to society and individual to power is changing, and individuals are somehow suffering a lot of anomie and are searching for meaning in some way. So you could argue that maybe there's something on, but it's a bit too general for my taste. Because when I look around <clears throat> and I think, I see different factors in different <laughs> places. So in Latin America, <clears throat> for example, the last 20 years have seen the rise of, of you know, starting in the mid-90s, but particularly in the last decade, you know, Latin America has had a lot of pluralism for a long time, but also very high levels of inequality high levels of social exclusion and so forth. And it took a while for Latin American democracies to develop opposition movements that really offered an alternative like the MAS in Bolivia or Correa in Ecuador or Chavez and Lula in Brazil. And, and so it took a while for sort of traditional politics Latin America to define a genuine alternative. When they did, that alternative simply was incompatible with uh, the market system and the institutions around it because it was a quasi-revolutionary project. So in Latin America, I can sort of understand the rise of polarization in Latin America, but that doesn't explain Turkey or India or Israel or lots of other places. So there, then there's the religious dimension. As I said, there is this pattern, and I haven't read the literature enough on why is religion, it seems to be related to this quest for meaning, is you know, the role of religion rising in many different societies. Societies are becoming more rather than less religious in many cases and why that's occurring despite the socioeconomic modernization that we associate with secular, secularism and thought was gonna to lead to a long-term decline in religiosity of people. So there's, there's a second factor there or something else going on that's very different from the Latin American one. And then in the established Western democracies, you have a long foundation from the 1940s to the present of fairly consensual politics, but then in the last 20 years, you have two big things that are, that are driving polarization or an alternative project. One is fairly long-term economic stagnation, low growth, and the middle class in the West is not doing very well anymore. It's either stagnant or sinking a little bit for the most part, particularly relative sort of the Asian middle class. And a lot of economic dislo dislocation because of globalization and so forth. So there's a lot of economic anxiety. And then there's also a lot of sociocultural anxiety because you've had the highest level of migration into the West of non-Western people in the last 20 years that you've ever had in history. And so you've had a period of a great deal of social change together with economic stagnation and displacement. And that's caused a lot of people to want to sign on to a different project to say that that consensual politics, that's just not serving my interest either economically or socially. So I want either I want Brexit or I want Trump or I want the National Front in France. I want something different. That, that, that's gonna give me an alternative. So Latin America has one set, <clears throat> some other countries, particularly the ones that 
polarizing around religion have another, and then the Western democracies seem to have another. So the why now, as always, I don't mean to make it sound just like a blizzard of complexity, but I think we have to be careful not to reach for a single factor explanation and say, oh, it's just this, because I, I, <clears throat> it's rarely just this in the world. The world's complicated, a lot of things are going on. But there is also about leadership. We do seem to be living in an age of the personalization of politics and the personalization of leadership. You've seen it in the United Kingdom over the last 20 years. I remember when Tony Blair became prime minister as an American, I watched and British friends of mine said, there's this odd presidentialization of British politics going on. We're treating Tony Blair like a president rather than a prime minister. And British leadership is starting to become a contest of leaders rather than parties. Um, and that's, that's a change in British, British, you know, it's a very party-based politics like German politics and so forth. And there does seem to be a personalization of politics occurring in many places. And I'm not sure what, why that is or what that is exactly, but you can feel it. You know, you can sort of feel that this, this is, um, Trump is not a party, he's a person. And the party is very secondary. And this is a country, a two-party system with deeply established parties with a long tradition. How is it that the party just melts away and one person just overrides, you know, the party that was pro-business, pro-immigration, pro-trade, in the course of a year becomes the party of the opposite? It's, it's astonishing. It's a, it's a power of the personalism of politics that, that is, is happening. So that aligns with what you're looking at a bit when thinking about what's common about some of these, some of these leadership projects. Let's take some more. <coughs> Where are you from, if I can ask? Uh, Spain. Spain, okay. I have two very quick I've questions. carefully not mentioned Spain, but it's an interesting case. We'll come to it. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, the first one was like, given that, uh, given that polarized governments seem to share many similar characteristics with authoritarian ones, could you provide us some clear cut differences between an authoritarian government and a polarized one? Okay. And the second, which authoritarianism I got it. Thanks. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm taking names. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, there's a lot in those questions. They're great questions. Thank you. Polarization sometimes, with respect to the first question about authoritarianism, you know, polarization can sometimes, as I mentioned, the third destination lead to, you know, an illiberal system in which becomes authoritarian. But we have to remember there are lots of authoritarians who are not polarizing. 
President Putin is not seeking to polarize Russia, he's seeking to unify it. His authoritarian project is based on a concept of national unity around his party, it's called unity, you know, it's unified Russia. And it's, it's uh, same with the Chinese authoritarian project. It's not a polarizing, but there's certain people who get excluded and stamped upon like the Uyghur, but it's not trying to say that there's an us and them in this country. They're saying it's, it's a we, we're all together. So lots of authoritarians pursue a project of national unification. And so polarizers arise in democracies and then can end up like Erdogan. I mean, Turkey wasn't really a well-established democracy, so there were fairly weak institutions to stop Erdogan's project, but it was a polarizing project that was trying to, you know, sort of cast the country as, as two, divided into two and then the one winning out over the other. So not all authoritarianism is polarization, and not all polarization ends up as authoritarianism. Um, <clears throat> Let me just touch on some of the others, and I may come back to a bit of what you said. On uh, populism, <clears throat> populism has become a really difficult subject to study and discuss because it's, uh, there's a lot of kind of loose talk and loose thinking about populism. It's been, I've been watched journalists who I, I deal with call and ask for questions and comments, I have questions and comments, and populism has become a kind of a label that's put on everybody who you know, suddenly President Putin is a populist. I mean, populism is supposed to be somebody who comes from outside the system and sort of enters it. President Putin was part of the internal security services of the country. He wasn't outside the system. You know, he's not a populist. He, there are populist techniques like direct communication of what you were describing. Of leaders are learning that what citizens like is stepping over the gatekeepers and doing the drip feed that I talked about of just reaching out directly to people and saying, I'm talking to you, you right there. I'm talking to you. It's a different kind of talk. And she thinks, oh, he's talking to me. And I'm also talking to you and you and you. I'm going to do it every day on TV. You're all going to listen to me. And you're going to think about me. And I'm going to come back to you in the afternoon with a comment on what I said in the morning. You know, and you, you create a spell on people. And, you, and they've learned, <clears throat> because of electronic communication and other forms, that that works really well <clears throat> as a leadership technique. You enter people's minds and you occupy their minds. And you, you, it's hard to think about other things because you, and you do outrageous things. You, you know, Boris Johnson in little bit ways has done these. You do startling things to sort of confuse people. You don't comb your hair. You do odd things. Um, so, so there's, there are leadership techniques that are populistic, but populism as a political project is different. Now, populism as a political project is often very polarizing because the nature of populism as a political project is an us and them project. We're us, you're them. But not all polarization is a result of populism. <clears throat> I would not actually call Modi a populist. I don't know what you think, but he's, he's not, it's not what I would really call a populist. He's an experienced politician who represents a movement who is fighting for a cause and such, and it's, it's different. So we have to be careful in not thinking that populism and polarization are one and the same thing, although there, there's a relationship. That actually makes me come back to your comment again about leadership. <laughs> on the why now question is most <coughs> polarized countries, <clears throat> if there's a project that's inserted itself in the political bloodstream and pushing, it's usually a grievance project. It goes back to what you mentioned about Mein Kampf, a grievance project. And uh, <clears throat> the Hindu nationalist movement is a grievance project. It's our country. These people are stepping in front of the line. All this affirmative action in India and multiculturalism and the outcasts and the you know, disfavored this, getting preferences and that. You know, it's our country. It's a grievance. It's a grievance of the majority, oddly. You know, it's like, why is the majority so aggrieved? But they're very aggrieved. That's the puzzle in the United States was sort of why, why do whites feel so threatened by people who feel so downtrodden, blacks and Hispanics and others, yet the whites say we're aggrieved by, by what they're doing to us. And that's why it's always so startling, these kind of grievance projects. Chavez was a grievance project. Um, <clears throat> and so... And Duterte in the Philippines is the grievance is insecurity, and we, our country has been, you know, we're, we live with insecurity. I'm going to fix that. You have you have fear. Turn to me. I'll handle it. That's like Uribe in Colombia. He was a, I will I will deal with your fears, and I will settle this once and for all. So it's often a grievance project in a way. Um, and then, common enemy. It's a really good insight. Is that one remedy? <clears throat> the United States was has been polarized for most of its history, actually. The one time we were clearly not polarized was the 1940s and 50s because of World War II. A common enemy is a great depolarizer. 
you finally come together. You know, I remember in Britain, I was living in Britain in the early 1980s, the difference between Margaret Thatcher and Michael Foote, that was a very wide, wide difference. But then the Falklands War came, and I remember I was here, and I remember watching the war unfold on the television, and it was a very fractured society in some ways in those years, but the Falklands War did for a moment really make British people feel like this is something I can be proud of. Um, although people objected and some on the left, but in general it, it, it helped Margaret Thatcher quite a bit to reach across to people who intensely disliked her. Um, so a common enemy, but <clears throat> somebody, a friend pointed out recently, it doesn't, it's not working in Israel. Israel has what it perceives as a common enemy, yet you have polarization over how to deal with the common enemy. You have two different views of how to deal with the Palestinians, and the Palestinians are polarized over their common enemy, which is Israel. You have the Hamas view and the Fatah view of how to deal with Israel. So shoot, turns out common enemy <laughs> doesn't always get you the national unity you might hope it would. Let's take a few more. Yeah. Questions, yeah. yeah. And um, let's not forget Mick, who's patiently sitting in the front row. I've got the mic, so I'll go. Um, thanks very much indeed. My name's Alex. I'm a research fellow here at IDS. Um, I wanted to ask you, so your book is called Democracies Divided, right? It's not called Societies Divided. Yeah. And so we've heard a lot about the societal elements that play out in polarization that are mobilized by yeah. um, polarizing leaders and so on, religious, ethnicity, and others. Um, but I'd like you to say a bit more about what is the work that democracy itself does? In other words, are we just talking about polarization that happens in all societies? Some of them happen mm -hmm. to be in democracies, and mm -hmm. let's look at some cases where polarizations happen in democracies. Or is there actually something about democracy as currently understood, liberal electoral democracy, uh, that plays into or away from? Yeah. You know, what is the work being done by the democracy bit of democracies yeah. divided? What are the, the mm -hmm. mechanisms, the dynamics, the processes which affect the ways in which polarization turns out differently in democracies mm -hmm. as opposed to yeah. uh, other Good. social yeah, forms? Yeah, thanks. We'll take this as the last round, if sure. that's okay. Yeah. And so put in your questions and we can choose whether to <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the factors that go beyond the internal system. <coughs> So you talked a lot of the characteristics that you were mm. describing speak to either the personalities or the systems as they are, mm -hmm. sort of presuming that there are no regional or international mm. impacts on how they perform and function. And so some, some things that sort of I find really interesting is the example of Turkey, for instance, mm. or Fathan Hamas, mm. or now oh, two things that struck me. So for instance, in the Turkish case, which you describe mm. as being pushed towards a competitive authoritarian model. Mm. And I would also say that it's also highly repressive because the guardrails that would perform what you yeah. would suggest are mm. either being thrown in prison or being dismissed in mass. And so also Erdogan's capacity to do what he does rests on his ability to draw on ideological repertoire of mm. a very imperialist is Islamist project. Mm. It's not merely internal or domestic factor. So in what ways is that regional context playing into his capacity to perform the role that he does. And similarly, if we also look at cases like Fatha or Hamas, or we look at other examples of what you describe as civil society amateurishness, for instance. Mm -hmm. So in the 2011-2013 yeah. period in Egypt, a lot of the mm -hmm. discussions that would bring together mm -hmm. people that were often being led by civil society groups, foreign funded, and often actually US department mm -hmm. support, mm -hmm. it was essentially being seen by some of those parties as support for one of the groups, yeah, definitely. if mm -hmm. not. Yeah. And so I think what I'm interested in hearing is more about the regional and international support that plays into mm -hmm. the hands of these groups. Mm -hmm. Hamas and Fatah are not polarized on their own. They're mm -hmm. being supported by different groups on each sure. side. Yeah, and the same goes for Turkey and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thanks. If we could keep our questions free. <laughs> um, I was wondering if there's any literature on the linkages between the anti-globalization movement the polarization in terms of politics and uh, the like constant ad constant reference to the past glory days and if that somehow is supporting this uh, mm. you know rise okay. in the polarization That's right. <coughs> a ter terrifically stimulating thank you um, i'm wondering whether there is an, another sort of parallel complementary underlying trend of rising inequality mm -hmm. and that the rising inequality is coming at the time when <coughs> uh, 
uh, and it was mentioned here, funding mm -hmm. becomes uh, very significant. Mm -hmm. People with lots and lots of money mm -hmm. feel very threatened mm -hmm. um, and exploit this by dominating the media. Mm -hmm. And I'm, it's, I'm partly projecting from this country from what we, what we see here. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering whether these mm -hmm. combine mm -hmm. as one part of, of the, of the mm -hmm. jigsaw. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Tom. Um, I want to go back to your answer to the question, you know, why now? Yeah. And I mean, I'm mm -hmm. very much in favor of your kind of answer to this, because mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of things, there's yeah. no simple mm -hmm. answer to this. Um, and one thing I guess you would agree with is, if you think there are a whole lot of things, you would add to that that some people are just learning from each other. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, you know, that's part of the story. Mm, when some people start doing it, other people start doing mm. it. Um, but I would... Just want to, I mean, you said something in one breath, but we just have many, much more democracy in the world these yeah. days, so there are many more political mm. leaders seeking to <laughs> get support. Definitely. So that's one yes. reason we have it. I just want to quickly okay. add two other possible points on this. One is that there is a, a story, some people have written about this, saying, well, part of the problem, again, is that in many of the older democracies, you know, people have kind of forgotten that they fought for democracy mm. and it's very valuable and they're kind of getting tired with it and yeah. they just don't value the democratic mm. institutions in yeah. the way they do in the past. Right. And my final point is I'm going to put slightly more technological or communications technology mm. determinist hypothesis to you than okay. I think <laughs> you're probably willing to accept. Yeah. But it seems to me, I mean, there has been a very important shift. In, if you talk of communications from political leaders to mm -hmm. ordinary people, the masses, um, there was a set before television, it was basically the word, and the word was either on the radio or it was written or it was face-to-face mm -hmm. -face in meetings. Mm -hmm. But um, I think once you get television, uh, then you know, the visual image tends to be more important. Mm -hmm. And I think I suspect that's part of the reason for the rise of personalism mm -hmm. in yes. politics in the US, yeah. etc., further back. Mm. And what we have now is we have, you know, the prevalence of the visual image, which, mm. you know, r gets into people's heads so much more quickly than written words do, mm. plus the instantaneousness of social media, which kind of, you know, is yeah. manufacturing and you know, accelerating all these mm. things together. Yeah. Um, okay. So there are my Good. kind of suggestions. Yeah. Okay, wow, these are, yeah, okay. One more. okay, all right, good, then I can, yeah, okay. yeah. It's, uh, it's Khalid, I'm from Pakistan and doing MA governance. Mm. Uh, during your lecture, I was thinking about Pakistan and mm. found it very interesting because mm. we can see so, so many of the polarizations all around in Pakistan, especially after the 15 years uh, war on terror. Mm. Uh, so there are like uh, Pashtun and uh, non-Pashtuns military versus civilian. Mm. Uh, but the most uh, interesting is like the new popular ruling party that is non-corrupts and corrupts. So if you are, uh, you one can be very much super corrupt, but if mm -hmm. he is in the popular uh, ruling mm. party, he is like uh, an angel. And on the other side, there might be so many angels, but they are corrupt. So <laughs> where it will, can, and it's a very, very strong polarization nowadays in Pakistan. Mm. So uh, there are some ethnic, some military and civilian, and uh, new yeah. forms. Uh, beyond the religion, there are now corrupts and non-corrupts. So what it will end, uh, how it will end, and is it polarization or not? Yeah. Or what is it? Mm. Except one left. You two. Okay, two last. Oh, that's okay. Keep them short and brief. Thank you for your fantastic speech. Uh, I come from China, and I'm really curious about uh, uh, how Chinese, I, because China has career has business around the world, and now it's not just about have money, it's about they're actually exporting their ideology to different countries, especially has their different in initiatives and the policies in different countries. Mm -hmm. So how this kind of uh, ideology will influence the local countries to mm -hmm. shift their uh, uh, political system or polarization because uh, clearly a lot of country has some uh, deep relationship with China but they also deeply indebted to the Chinese government mm -hmm. so how that will influence their decision making mm -hmm. mm, thank you thanks, thanks. and one last <laughs> <laughs> hi um, 
So I was thinking of the role of the citizen in, in, in these polarized systems or situations that are happening. And in the book you have the Brazilian case and Indonesian case. And it's mentioned that high levels of corruption and clientelism make perhaps the identification with parties or ideological identification less severe mm. than in our countries. But these are highly unequal countries. Mm. So is this that they are still waiting for a charismatic leader to foster the polarization? Or is it that they're <coughs> political and democratic disappointed is that big that they don't care? Mm -hmm. And they won't take a position in that right. polarization. OK, well, let me just touch on some of these. Wow, fantastic questions and comments. Let me, I won't get to everything, but let me just do my best. First on that last point. Yeah, the chapter on Brazil and to a lesser extent Indonesia are, are interesting in this regard that um, a highly patronage, sort of a political system in which there's both a lot of patronage politics but a fair amount of alternation of power tends to avoid polarization because when you come into power as the Brazilian president, um, often with your par party a minority in the parliament, uh, you need to make political deals with others to form a coalition. And so, and then you need to make dirty deals to sort of give people different parts of the system to make that coalition work. And it is actually kind of depolarizing because you don't really want to carve the line really sharply. You want to keep it flexible who you're going to work with and who you're not. And Brazil, in some ways, avoided the polarization of Colombia or Argentina or Venezuela and others under Lula and even before because of this flexibility of the Brazilian system. But then, because of the overarching corruption and the sordidness of it, citizens got really disgusted and the legal system struck back against it, sort of swept aside you know, that system and then kind of burned down the forest of Brazilian political parties and then Bolsonaro came and said, now I'm the alternative. So for a while, Brazil avoided a kind of deep left-right cleavage in that way because of the kind of trading nature of Brazilian politics, but now it's in a different phase and it's not clear what's going to happen. So patronage, not a good thing, produces a lot of inequality, but it can be, you think of Ukraine also, Ukrainian politics never really polarized. It could have around an east-west axis or a pro-Russian, anti-Russian axis, but it was such a patronage-oriented system. Ukrainian politicians never really stood for anything other than just their own personal wealth project for the most part. So patronage is, is in that sense, depolarizing. Uh, <clears throat> Pakistan, uh, I don't know very much about Pakistan. A little bit, but not enough. So I'd actually be I'm t taking on board what you said, and I need to do more research to think. It strikes me it has multiple cleavages, and it's a multiple cleavages and a very complex sort of set of divisions within the society. Uh, Mick, your technological determinism point, I take it. I, I think I try to resist it just to force ourselves to think harder about other things because I live in a country that loves technological determinism and we blame everything on technology these days and it stops thinking rather than advances thinking. And so I, I, what you say makes sense to me, you know, right? starting with television on through. It isn't just social media. It's, you're right, life has changed. People absorb information differently. And we have the first president of the United States who literally doesn't read things. He only, he's fact, memos that are sent to him are visual memos with drawings and such because he doesn't read text. I mean, he, you know, he likes images of things and so cartoons and things like that are good. Um, so, but I take the point. Uh, China, as I mentioned, <clears throat> both China and Russia like, have a, a unified authoritarian concept of power and how it should be exercised. And as China works in Africa and South Asia and other parts of the world to exchange its ideas with others and spread its thinking, it very much conveys a model of you have to stay unified, both because the economic system should be state-led in this way, and you need a coherent unified state to do that. You need constancy of power, and then you also need a political project of stability, and stability is provided by you know, unity rather than constant division. So you could call China a great depolarizer because they're insisting on, I'm just joking, they're insisting on a, a different kind of vision of politics which doesn't admit divisions kind of, so they, they have a different concept. Um, but they're doing that in countries like Mozambique or to some extent Angola and others, Zimbabwe, that have a lot of deep divisions. So it doesn't, China's ideas can't override the realities, the structural realities of societies they're working in, whether it's Sri Lanka or 
Zimbabwe or others. <clears throat> um, I want to go back to the very first question about democracies divided. You're, you put your finger on it, you know, we could have a whole other session on, you're right, we call it democracies divided because my, my thinking was that polarization, political polarization that becomes elite and mass polarization in society tends to happen in democracies because democracies allow divisions to be magnified and, and sort of built into the society. And you see authoritarian countries that are at some level sort of polarized or have very much an inclination, but the system is suppressing that. So like Iraq under Saddam Hussein between the Shia and the Sunni was a very polarized country in certain ways, but he just didn't allow that into political life. He suppressed it. Or in Malaysia, for example, <clears throat> is a very polarized country in certain ways between the Malays and the Chinese, yet the political system was designed to actually suppress and to mediate, actually in a useful way, and that country kept it on a good developmental path for many years. And so authoritarianism doesn't really permit polarization, it suppresses. Iran is struggling with this. Iran wants to be a non-polarized country, but there's a deep reformist, non-reformist sort of division that, that's bubbling up and sort of breaking through Iranian authoritarianism. So, so that's why we focus on democracies. <clears throat> but then it does lead to your question, well, is it something about democracies? I mean, they're open to competition, and so they're open to this happening. There is a, but there are questions then about are certain kinds of democratic political systems more inclined to that than others? For example, presidential versus prime minister, two-party versus multi-party. One can do studies that way and say are certain democracies just more vulnerable because of the way the system design is than others? So we could get to that. Um, and then inequality. Yes, <clears throat> I do think you're right. There's, we're in a world of greater inequality within states, but actually less inequality among states because of the relative rise of Asia and there's a few other places. Um, and clearly inequality creates social friction and the potential for division and conflict. There's just no question that a more unequal society has greater potential for, it has diminished social cohesion and greater potential for anger and conflict. I think, as I mentioned, some of the divisions we see are not driven by inequality, like India or Turkey, whereas others like Venezuela are. So I think inequality is definitely something that's turning up the temperature of politics in a lot of countries where it's experienced as, as a rising reality. Uh, but in some places it's, it's directly a cause, but in others I don't think so much so. It's just my, my impression. Uh, I'm gonna stop there, time's short, I need to get going, it's been a long session. So okay. thanks it. Well, that's been an incredibly stimulating talk for a lunchtime seminar. I think that's a lot of food for thought. Um, thank you. Let's give Tom another round of applause.